six months ago, I made the biggest mistake of my woodworking career. Now I have one chance for redemption. If you aren't one of the precious few people that actually consider yourself a fan of my channel, let me catch you up to speed. About six months ago, I was finishing a three table $30,000 package for a couple over in Europe. I got almost all the way done with all three tables after the clients had already been waiting over a year and I found trapped moisture inside the wood, essentially rendering all three tables unusable. I was despondent. I didn't know what to do. I had to have a very uncomfortable call with them where I said, hey, I messed up. Do you want your money back? And they said, no, we'd like to stick with you, even if that means waiting another six or eight months for our tables. And that's why I consider this to be the double or nothing or the redemption build, because I can't get it wrong this time. Some of you are probably wondering, how do you guarantee you don't have the same exact problem with trapped moisture that you did last time again on these slabs? And the answer is embarrassingly simple. All I have to do is check the moisture content with a pinless moisture meter. And this one's by Wagner. It's the Orion 950. And it's an investment. It's like 550 bucks, but it could have saved me anywhere from $4,000 to $30,000, depending on how you look at that last build. So I make sure every single slab that I buy now is checked, not just in one spot, but in multiple spots. Feel good about it? I, I feel good about the moisture content of this wood, at least. I will say my wood supplier, Gobi Walnut, really stepped up. He said, hey, what can I do to make up for those slabs that weren't properly dried? And these slabs were even nicer than the last ones, but they cost almost triple. These two slabs were about $12,000. And I said, if you really want to make it up to the clients, you can give them these slabs at no additional cost. And he said, absolutely no problem. So in the end, the client is actually getting wood that is much, much nicer at no additional cost to them. Good stuff. <laughs> I didn't need to stop it. <laughs> uh, he's letting it go. After I composed myself from nearly dropping a $6,000 slab of wood minutes into ownership, I got to work on choosing the layout and this is exactly what I did on the previous build with these clients so they knew what to expect and this is a lengthy process. This can be a challenge because you have a husband, you have a wife, and you have a woodworking YouTuber that all think that they know best. However, they're paying me so I do my best to help them make the best decision for themselves because in the end the decision really is on them and they should get exactly what they want but it's my job to help them make that decision. And it's a fun process. I actually really enjoy doing that. And these clients were great to work with. There's a lot about these builds and these videos that I can't control. I really can't control the finished color tone of the wood. I can't control how long these slabs take to dry in the kiln. I can't control how many people comment saying, how dumb do you have to be to be 12 months into a $30,000 project and not even check the moisture content of the wood? That sounds suspicious. We think that you're lying just to get more views. Which, by the way, I really wish I was lying about that, but I am, or at least I was that dumb. However, one of the things I have total control over is how methodical and how delicate I am cleaning up these slabs, because I really think that separates the okay tables from the extraordinary tables. And that's why I really take my time. I want to make sure I don't break off any chunks and keep it as absolutely as natural as possible. When you uh, plane it, is it gonna... Is it gonna go through the other yeah. side? No, I think we still have plenty of room there. <laughs> Went through. Okay, if my customers are watching, that one was also out of my control. The rest of the slab clamp though, that is within my control. Anyway, after that last video debacle, I had the people from Wagner Moisture Meters reach out and they said, hey, what about this upcoming redemption video? Can we be a part of that one? And I was like, well, people like free stuff and I like my viewers. Do you want to give away some stuff to my viewers? And they're like, yeah, we do. And so they have put together a prize package. I think there's going to be three winners. Again, these moisture meters are like $550 a piece. So there's going to be at least three of those. And I think they're throwing in some more stuff as well. So there's a link in the video description if you want to check that out. Makes me a little nervous. What do you think? Be Only if there's a video showing what could happen if a joint or accident goes bad. I think we'll be fine. That was a quick clip from my woodworking accidents in slow motion video that I did a few months ago that's a great watch if you love woodworking and hate falling asleep peacefully at night. The reason I was so needlessly doing that sketchy operation on the jointer is to get this perfect fit on the complementary piece for the console table and Anytime I do any dangerous acts on a YouTube video here, 
I always worry that someone's going to watch this video and do the same thing and have a horrible accent. And I have to say, if you do do that, make sure the camera's rolling and tag me in the comments. If you've never seen a twin turbo vice, this is a twin turbo vice. It's made by a guy named Andy Klein. He's just a normal dude. He's a woodworker I met on Instagram. But the main difference is he's got a brain that's like two pounds heavier than mine and can actually invent stuff. And that vice doesn't just look cool, it's also the best vice I've ever used. Now I had to try to fix this spot that I blew through from the other side and hopefully make it look like it was never there. And for that, I'm using some clear epoxy and luckily it was still a pretty tight fit. So I'm hoping that friction is gonna be good enough to hold that in place and make it look like it was never there. And after that, there is a handful of these kind of small to medium cracks. It wasn't the worst slab, wasn't the best slab I've ever worked with. But what was coming up next was something I was absolutely dreading, and now I had to tackle it. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but building a full eight foot epoxy table form is actually easier than doing just one of these corners. And this corner is only about two feet by 18 inches or so, but it is much more difficult than just building a big form, dropping your table in and pouring the epoxy. The advantage of course is I'm using much less epoxy, which I love. The problem is it is tough to get a perfect seal around an odd shape like this. You're bound to get leaks. And then when you surface it, you run into a whole bunch of problems there as well. If you've been considering building your first epoxy table, or maybe you want to get a little bit better at making these tables to try to generate some revenue and pay for this expensive hobby that we have, I highly recommend checking out my virtual epoxy workshop. It is over three and a half hours long, it's 32 chapters, and actually after that last video debacle, I ended up adding two new chapters just on the wood buying process. I added two additional chapters on the wood finishing process because as I learn more, I continue to update that workshop. I'll never do an epoxy workshop 2.0 and make you pay more. As I learn more, I share more. And it's something I'm incredibly proud of. We've sold several thousand of these over the year and a half or so that it's been out. And I still engage with people every week. I answer every single question that they leave in the comments to the best of my ability anyway. And right now we're running the spring sale. We only do a couple of sales a year. So if you've been considering it, Highly recommend checking that out. There's a link in the video description. You can see that the slab isn't really a perfect square at this point, and that's actually by design, although it does cause this form making to be a little bit more difficult. And this corner is essentially squared off, so this one wasn't so bad. It was the other corner that still has a bit of a taper. And the reason why I'm leaving it oversized at this point is I have run into so many problems over the years by cutting my pieces too small too early and then I have a problem that I didn't expect, and I wish I had that buffer, those extra inches, to enable me to get the table the exact size and the exact shape that I want. And quick spoiler, I actually run into that exact problem on this table, and I'm really thankful I have those extra inches. Almost a year ago now, I hired Scott, my full-time videographer and editor, and he is incredible at what he does. He's a great videographer, he's great at editing, and it was honestly the best thing I've ever done for my business. And on top of all that, it's great to have a sounding board in the shop because sometimes you don't realize how dumb you actually are, or at least I don't realize how dumb I am because Scott is legitimately much smarter than me. And here he came up with a great tip. You should try poking a hole in it like you're shotgun in a beer. Never thought of that. Would it work? Oh, I don't feel right. like it should. All right, I'm gonna do it. You're, you're going? Yep. Yeah. All right, we're shotgunning. Oh my God. Oh my God. Look at it go. Look at it. Do you know how many of these I have poured like an asshole? Oh, what a time to be alive. <laughs> This might not be a huge shock to some of you out there, but I'm doing black epoxy with this walnut. And especially with this particular walnut, because it is so freaking nice, I think it would be a tragedy to use any other color other than black. The brown and the blacks and these streaks in there really just complement each other. And if you want to see something different though, I have a build coming up that might be the coolest thing I've ever built. I 
can't say too much about it because I don't want someone to beat me to it because I've never seen anybody else do what I'm trying to do. But there's no walnut, there's no black epoxy, and that's about all I can say. And it's also, it's not my mammoth tusk, which I'm also doing a video on restoring a real life mammoth tusk. I bought a 115 pound, like seven foot long tusk, and I'm gonna restore it. And that is also gonna be super cool. And if you wanna make sure you don't miss out on any of those future builds, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button, if I've earned it, and you actually wanna see more of this stuff. All right, it's been about two minutes, and we got our first leak, which Scott, the video guy, was not surprised on because this was just such a weird angle. But, uh, flex paste, and this is all new, so it shouldn't be dried out. All right, let's see if that lasts. If you wanna to try to build one of these epoxy tables, one of the best tips I can give you is to get some of this flex paste and keep it on hand, just in case you get a leak. I often get a lot of comments from people that say to just use that roof patch stuff. And that roof patch, that tar type stuff, is meant to hold water out, not to hold water in. And I've tried it and it does not stop epoxy in the slightest. So do yourself a favor, get some flex space. Also, if you want a favor on which mold release to use, I learned a hard lesson because I tried to buy some cheap stuff. And here is the one you do not want to use. Get this, I wanna, I wanna show this. If you ever see this brand, <laughs> go the other way. I, I wanna make perfectly clear, whoever, whoever monster sells this should be up there with Philip Morris and the tobacco community. It can't even go in the garbage can. I will leave a link to a mold release that I do like and I know works in the video description and that will be an affiliate link. However, if you are tired of YouTubers taking money out of the pockets of the Jeff Bezoses of the world and you do not want to support my channel, definitely do not click on those video links and just do a standard Google search instead. I got everything loaded up to go to Creative Woodworking Northwest, a place up in Portland that rents me time out on their big industrial machines. and. One of the caveats you have to using these machines is they say if you hit metal, it's like a $300 charge because it tears up their belts in this sander and they have to fix a bunch of things and can even break the blades in the planer head. And one of the exceptions, luckily I learned, is that lead is acceptable and that's what we found there. And I thought this was perfectly fitting because we found a lead bullet and this is going to Europe and Europeans, everybody knows, loves guns. So they got a nice little surprise for their table there. I actually thought the bullet was really cool and I was hoping the clients would let me keep it in the table so I was banking on them knowing US knowledge about as well as I know European knowledge and so I told them it was most likely a civil war relic and definitely not some drunk redneck that shot at a tree because it resembled his ex-wife. I know not everybody works with slabs every day like I do but this wood at this point was starting to get me pretty excited. It was really genuinely some of the nicest wood I've ever even seen. And once you run it through that planer, you can really start to see how the colors and the figure are coming out. And there was, I don't wanna say a problem, but an issue that I needed to address with this one. This had this big natural void and it's gonna be on the underside, but it was right where the table base was gonna be mounted. So I didn't wanna have bolts running right into that epoxy. Probably could have gotten away with it, but I think this is gonna be a much better long-term solution. This big void is a situation like I mentioned earlier that I don't really have control over. I can't control where there's a big bark inclusion or a knot hole. And when I first started taking commissions, one of my first big orders was from an interior designer and I had done a horrible job managing her expectations leading into it. And so as I got the wood surfaced, I showed her some knot holes and she just told me, I don't like those, they shouldn't be there. And I didn't know what to tell her. I was like, okay, let me do my best to remove this knot hole. And that's my fault because I did not manage her expectations. I did not tell her that this is a natural product. There's gonna be things that come up, some things that are even man-made that are unexpected like that bullet. We just have to do our best to work around them and to work with them. And that's what I'm doing here is I'm essentially making a big solid wood inlay. So I have a perfectly secure mounting point for the table base. 
A few months ago, I tried my hand at doing my very first patchwork table, and I think the patchwork design is super cool. A lot of people don't like it, and I think that's fine because it is a very unique style. But that's essentially what I'm trying to do here. Even though this is on the underside of the table, everything I learned here was from doing that patchwork table. And what I do is I cut this large recess, and there's always a bunch of little spots I miss with the router. So it's usually quicker for me to come back with the chisel and just clean them up here. I do need to square the corners off because the method that I use needs nice sharp corners. So I cut everything to a perfect 90. And then I use my table saw to trim it down to the exact size. And this really only works if you have a very accurate table saw. So I'd make a few cuts and I could see there it's just barely wedges in there. And then I use my miter saw to cut the other edge. And now I'm just hoping it's snug, but not too tight, but you really only get one chance at this. So you have to get it just right and I felt like I had it about right there. And when you're doing an inlay like this, it's always useful if you can have a slight chamfer or bevel on the underside. And this was such a big piece, I decided to use my 45 degree router bit. And this will one, enable it to go in a little bit easier, but two, give the glue somewhere to go when you put it in. You guys probably don't realize that there is a lot of footage that goes into these videos for this three table package. We had about eight and a half hours of footage and I'm always trying to work on getting more efficient because I actually keep all my footage forever. But occasionally I'm reminded why we record so much material and here's a good example of it. Sound is, yep, sound is on. All right, what is first? I'm gonna smooth out the big patch with the belt sander after that. We'll put <laughs> Second tip, were you actually rolling for that? I was, yeah. Disengaged. All right, let's try this again. So we're gonna get this. Let's try this patch first and just see how it looks. Besides that little belt sander drag race we had there, everything actually went exactly as I was hoping. It sat just proud enough, but not too proud that it was a big nightmare to flatten. Only took maybe five minutes or so to smooth it out. And this is exactly what I was hoping for, a nice, solid, smooth surface to mount the table base to. I've mentioned a couple times that a lot of this woodworking is out of our control. We can't control things like cracks and knots. Not always, however, we can take some steps to give us a little bit better of a chance when it comes to working with those. And one of the best tips I can give you is building these tables slightly oversized to begin with, because that gives us the flexibility to work around some of these natural defects. And there's a really good example coming up because here I'm cutting off the end grain and it looks fine. However, on the bigger table, we had some problems and I was glad I built it oversized. So I have the first tough choice to make on this big slab table here. I had all my measurements just perfect and it was gonna actually line up exactly how I'd imagined, but I got this cut and there's a ton of checks, I meaning there's a ton of cracks on this end grain. And it's not uncommon, but I wasn't expecting this many. And so I can cut more off this, but then if I do that, there could still be cracks and now I'm making that other end have less margin for error. So I don't know exactly what to do. I'm gonna probably stare at this for another 15 minutes or so. Well, I think I made the right decision. I got rid of a ton of the checks over here. I got the big cracks, which I knew those were gonna stay. Couple small ones left here, but feel good about the decision. I really like the look of this 22 and a half degree chamfer on the underside of my tables. I've done it for years and I've continued to evolve exactly how I've done it. I used to do it like this with the track saw where I would overlap that track just slightly. But the problem is it's very, very hard to line up each corner. If it's off just by, I'd say a millimeter, but a 10th of a millimeter, those corners won't line up perfectly. And here's where I'm joining those two. You'd see that one was off just a little bit. So to combat this, I bought this big oversized router bit a few months ago that's a little bit dangerous to use. And that does work well and very accurately, but it takes so many passes and makes such a giant mess that it really isn't practical for making these huge chamfers. So finally, I've learned to combine these two methods where 
I make that first cut with a track saw, remove about 95% of it, and then I just go through with this oversized router bit and make one final shallow pass, and that leaves a perfect corner. Some of you have probably noticed something about this video that's a little bit different than most of my past videos, and that is that everything is actually going pretty well so far, and other than my belt sander long jump competition, I haven't really had any major problems. This dining table shaping up exactly as I was hoping it would, I haven't blown up any router bushings. Doing the edge profile on this desk, everything was looking good. Everything until I got to do the edge profile on the console table, then we ran into the problem. I feel like sometimes I tend to be a little dramatic when I'm talking about these problems I have with these tables. This is not going very well. I'm kind of panicking right now, and I feel like I might actually puke. They're all genuine concerns and genuine problems, but I'm gonna try not to overdo this one, but it really isn't good. Basically, this wood is twisted on me, so it's not just got a little bit of a bow in it, it's got a twist, and I think the only thing I can do from here is actually take it in and get it CNC'd and resurfaced and then hopefully it'll stay flat after that, but not great. This is another good reason why it's important to keep your pieces as large as possible as long as possible. And that's not just the length and the width, but also the thickness. Because if I had said I wanted it surfaced right down to that 1.75 inches from the beginning, and then I got a twist in it, I wouldn't have enough wood left over to get a nice looking table and have it be perfectly flat. However, I'd left this one a little bit thicker. I like the look of it, but it also gave me the flexibility to come back now, fix this twist with the CNC, run it through their wide belt sander, and I still have a 1.75 inch table, and it's perfectly flat now. I really want to thank Aaron and Jordan over at Gobi Walnut for getting me in so quickly. I had this problem come up. I reached out and said, hey, can we get into the CNC? Normally CNC appointments take like a couple weeks to get and they got me in I think the same day or maybe even the next day for a quick flattening and really meant a lot to me and saved me because I did not have a weeks to spare on this project and now I was able to get it home, get this round over, continue my edge profile, no chamfer on that one, but I did have some holes that needed to be filled and this is kind of fun but it can be a real challenge too. So I just realized something Scott. What's that? I'm colorblind. Oh. <laughs> um, can you help me with this? Yeah, I think that one's a little more red than that. What about these? I like that. Part. Hold on, I, I got an idea. I'm on the camera, you're bet you're. you're <laughs> say like, right about that this spot. One here? Yeah. Kind of the same? Yeah, kind of the same area in here. I don't know why I'm the one looking at this, Scott. What are, you, are these where, where they should be? I think so. All right. This method to fill small holes is really fun and kind of challenging and a new skill to learn, but I actually found a better way to do it, but it doesn't work for every single hole, and I'll show you that method here in a couple minutes. But for now, all I'm doing is making a toothpick that runs across the grain, essentially, so it can hopefully keep the grain running the right direction and get a nice snug fit there. And this is always a bit of a challenge. I've done this before. Sometimes they break, sometimes they don't. And sometimes the wood just doesn't look as good as I thought it would. Think it's gonna break? Uh, this one I think you'll be good. How about that one? That one I think will break. Ah. This is that better method for filling a hole that I mentioned earlier. This is called a plug cutter, and I used to use these a couple of years ago, but I haven't used it in a long time, and I realized I was actually using it incorrectly at first. What you wanna do is you wanna go all the way down like I do here, and that creates a nice slight taper, and that's kind of the magic of these plugs, because if you drill a quarter inch hole and it's off by a hundredth of an inch or so, this plug continues to taper, and so it'll just keep going down until you get that perfect fit. And it's really quite genius because no drill bit, no router bit are, are ever exactly what they say they are. It's not gonna be exactly 0 0.25000. It's always gonna be off by a little bit, and this plug makes up for that. I make a lot of jokes on this channel, and 
Most of the time, they're intentional. Most of the time, I like antagonizing certain groups because it amuses me, and hopefully it amuses some of you out there too, like the incredibly sensitive Beatles fans or the anti-circumcision crowd that, despite their name, have incredibly thin skin. I am almost always intentionally antagonizing them because I think everybody can toughen up a little bit. However, in a recent video, I was talking about this drill press that I'm using, and I said that it was made in Taiwan, which is part of China, because I am legitimately an ignorant American, and I did not know they were different. I looked it up, and Taiwan is named the Republic of China, and China is called the People's Republic of China, which are incredibly different things, apparently, and I genuinely do apologize to anybody I offended there, because that was legitimately me just being dumb. And if anybody doesn't know why that was such a big mistake, apparently saying that Taiwan is part of China is just like saying that Ukraine is part of Russia or telling someone from Houston that Texas is just another state. There are things that you just don't say. If I didn't mention it earlier and you're wondering why are there so many holes in the slab, these are all pins where they check the moisture content of these slabs that are drying. And since in that last video, we had such a problem with the trapped moisture in the wood, they wanted to make extra sure the slab was extra dry, so there was more pins than there normally is, and I didn't love it, but I did love having perfectly dry wood that we knew was completely dry all the way through, so I was fine filling a few of these holes, and you can see they're not perfect. If you know where to look, you can find these, but they are about as good as I can do. How'd they look on camera? Uh, the one you just did looks really good. The other one that we did earlier. You can see that one? Yeah. We were gonna be all done. Do we, re do, we do, do we redo that one? Yes, I think so. Man, I was busting my balls. The other ones just turned out so much better. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> In the few years that I've been woodworking professionally, one of the things I've never regretted is taking the extra time to fix something that I knew I could do better. I've regretted not doing it plenty of times, but when you think, oh, this is gonna take me another 20 minutes, this will take me another hour, this will take me another day, you're never gonna regret spending that time, but you might look at a finished piece and realize, you know, I could have done better, I wish I would have just made it right, and I think this is a really good example of one of those pieces. Well, I did my very best, but I know some of you are gonna say, hey, I can see that dot from here. You did a horrible job. Well, guess what? This is a natural dot, the wood. These are the plugs that we filled that you didn't notice, so f off. All right, apparently the Beatles fans aren't the only ones who can be sensitive. And anyway, I needed to find a way to fill these cracks on the end of the table. And I didn't wanna just fill them aesthetically. I actually wanted that epoxy to soak down into them and really help hold them shut because some of them went fairly deep and most of them weren't very wide. So I had to just kind of feather this epoxy down in it and probably spend a good couple hours just coming back every so often and just trickling in a little bit more of this epoxy. And I did add some bow ties to the underside for a couple of the big cracks. Didn't show that in the video because basically just me adding a couple of bow ties and we've all seen that too many times. But this epoxy I did feel like was pretty important to really spend the time and get it soaked down deep into those cracks. This piece had a sneaky number of tiny cracks. When you stand back and you look at it, it looks like a pretty solid piece, meaning not a lot of rot, not a lot of cracks, not a lot of knot holes. However, when you get up very close to it, there was a frightening number of these tiny little imperfections. So I spent much longer than usual doing these. This is the CA glue. I highly recommend this thick gel CA glue. It works a little bit better than the thin stuff, which tends to just soak down into the wood. And it is kind of a fun process for the first five minutes. The next three hours, not so much. They make a black CA glue that's a really nice color, but I feel like it's a little too thin and it ends up soaking into the wood and actually stains the wood. So what I do is I mix that black with that gel and it makes kind of a medium thick version of that same black CA glue. Anytime I need to fill the holes that should stay black. Most of the time I just use clear, but I do like filling using the black when I'm touching up the actual epoxy itself. I continued to work on these three tables, and at this point in the project, I was pretty much sending them daily updates of what was happening, and I'm always very self-conscious of being the contractor from that episode of Seinfeld that kept bugging him every five minutes with a new question, so I always have a conversation before we start saying, hey, I can send you frequent updates, I can send you 
occasional updates or I cannot send you any updates. And so far, pretty much everybody seems to say more updates. We want all the updates. And I feel like I would want updates too, but I'm really curious, would you guys actually want updates daily or would that be too much? One of the nice things about having previously built all three of these tables is I already had all the legs in the table base just sitting around waiting to be installed. I was a little nervous having to store these for an extra eight months in a relatively small shop. Didn't want to get them dinged or chipped or anything like that, but somehow they managed to stay in good shape. Just had to recess the mounting plates there, had a nice fit. This one I was terrified getting it up and down the stairs. I was so worried that we were going to chip that one or dent it. And this is a spider table base. This is made by Bryson Steele. He's made a few of these for me in the past. This is really one of my favorite table bases for any of the dining tables I use. We've all heard those slightly misleading statistics that say something to the effect of 95% of all automobile accidents occur within a half mile of home, so you need to be extra diligent for the entire drive. And those statistics never actually mention that most trips occur close to home. However, the point they're trying to make is it's easy to get complacent when you're almost done with something, and that definitely does apply to woodworking. And these threaded inserts are a perfect point of that because it would be so easy to just kind of hurry this along and forget to set your depth and I've had friends that have gotten to this point of the project forget to set their depth on that thread insert and blow through the top of the table with that drill bit. So just a reminder, go all the way through the finish line. Pay attention until you're all the way in the garage. As I'm wetting this slab down, I'm getting a little bit of PTSD from that first debacle table build that had the three tables that were ruined from trapped moisture and if you missed it earlier, I want to remind everybody that Wagner is giving away the three Orion 950, the $550 moisture meters, and I could ask them for a bunch of money to plug their product. Instead, I asked them to give product away to you guys. So I hope you enjoy it, and I hope the three winners enjoy it as well. If you want details on that, there's a link in the video description below. Anybody who's built anything knows the pain of sanding. It is essentially the flossing of the woodworking world. It is so tedious. Nobody likes doing it. Everybody lies about how often they do it, but it is incredibly necessary. And I won't make you watch me floss this entire table. Instead, we can skip right to the good stuff, the finishing process. This piece of walnut was incredibly dense. It was very hard and very, very heavy, much more so than most black walnut pieces I work with. And in spite of this, it was very, very thirsty. It kept absorbing more and more finish. Every time I'd buff a little bit on, it would look almost instantly dry. And I don't necessarily see this as a bad thing. The more finish that gets absorbed into a piece of wood, the more protected it's gonna be. But it was just very, very surprising. As I went along, you can see the top there looks almost completely dry. So kept adding more finish. You basically want to just saturate it, make, make it so the wood cannot accept any more finish. And after about 15 minutes, then you wipe off any excess. I wiped all the excess oil off the dining table, got that set aside and got to work on the console table. And while I was doing these tables, I also refinished a set of coasters for these clients that I'm going to throw into the crate. It's just kind of a nice little surprise. And a little bit of a thank you for them being so patient. And for the desk, I had an extra special guest. This is Eric G. He has a local home improvement show called Around the House with Eric G. And he asked if he could come film a segment. I said, I gotta finish a desk, you wanna watch that? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So we talked shop while I finished this desk. And if you want any more information about him, I'll leave it in the video description as well. One of the silver linings to messing those first three tables up is if I would have finished those tables on schedule, that would have been before I had this N3 nano coating. And this is an absolute game changer for the woodworking world. This ups the contrast, this ups the sheen, but most importantly, it ups the protection. It's always the question everybody asks, how do I use this every day with my family? If they have kids, if they have spilled, if they have rude guests, this is the way. I've been doing a ton of tests with it. I was recently doing a water test where I had a side-by-side -side comparison of just Rubio versus Rubio with the N3 and the water wouldn't even flow over to the side with the N3. It was a really kind of a trippy effect and it's pretty simple to put on. I do have a how-to video over on my other channel, Blacktail Studio Uncut, and it's something I think is going to change the way we finish wood going forward. 
So here is the dining table first. This is some of the prettiest wood I've ever seen. I've never seen gray tones like this in walnut. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Here is the bullet for the Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that looks fantastic. Oh, it looks Cam. amazing. Yeah, 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 and that table has so much detail in it. That wood is just, yeah. God, yeah. that's just, a, oh, amazing. So here is the desk. I don't know if you remember what base you were you, you requested because it's been so long. <laughs> I do. It looks great. And this wood is from the same tree, but it doesn't have the gray in it, but it's got just a crazy amount of color and figure. Yeah. No, I love the flow of that. That's, yeah, that's beautiful. Also, I had this piece um, that I built it for kind of a weird reason. And if you are interested in it, I would love to include this at no cost, just for you guys being such good sports. It's an end table. Oh yeah, oh. your waterfall end table. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. So if you'd like me to include this in the crate, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I love it. Yes, please. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Yes. All right, the last one, your console table here, the biggest struggle of all three tables, at least this revision of all three tables. And it's hard to compare anything to the dining table, but I really like how this one turned out. I love it though. Yeah, it, looks, it looks, looks beautiful. Yeah. Are you ready for him? Yes, sir. Well, I applaud your patience. We yeah. uh, applaud your work. <laughs> yes. Thank you guys again, and I'll be in touch. All right. All right. Thanks for the update again. Thank you. Every week, I like to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with which table you like best, and I'll know you made it all the way to the end of the video. Have a great week. Ready to go. Sweet. Everything's in there. The uh, end table. End table's in there. The leg levelers. Leg levelers in there. Maintenance spray. I almost forgot, we're offering an N3 maintenance spray that is a monthly refresh to keep your N3 finished products looking new forever. Got it. Got the coasters?